So I want to read to you from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah is very important. He is the most quoted prophet in all of the New Testament. So uh, he's the one that Jesus quotes. Extremely important. And Isaiah is a huge book in the Old Testament, but uh, this is from chapter 62 of Isaiah, from verse 1 to 5. I will speak out to encourage Jerusalem. I will not be silent until she is saved. And when the Bible speaks of Jerusalem, it's speaking about all of us because that's where we're called to dwell. We're called to dwell in Jerusalem. So I will speak out to encourage Jerusalem. God wants to encourage you, to give you courage. I will not be silent until she is saved. And her victory shines like a torch in the night. Jerusalem, the nations will see you victorious. All their kings will see your glory. You will be called by a new name, a name given by the Lord himself. You will be like a beautiful crown for the Lord. No longer will you be called forsaken or your land be called deserted white. Your new name will be God is pleased with her. Your new name will be God is pleased with her. Your land will be called happily married because the Lord is pleased with you and we will be like a husband to your land. Like a young man taking a virgin as his bride, he who formed you will marry you. As a groom is delighted with his bride, so your God is delighted with you. So your God is delighted with you. God is delighted with you. This is extremely important for us who live in a world of discouragement where so many people feel unloved, discouraged, people live without hope. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, that we have just heard here, these five verses, is not alone among the prophets in portraying our relationship to God in images of covenantal love. So, the same relationship that a husband has to a wife. The church is referred to as a her. And Jesus is married to the church. If you read the New Testament, you will see this over and over again, that God is married to the church. And the church is not a building. You would know that very well. The church is us. So if we didn't have a place to meet in the church building, but we met in a cafeteria or a school or somewhere, we would still have church because the church is us. We are the church and God is married to the church. So God is married to you. You are married to Jesus as a church. People think that it's only nuns who are married to Jesus, but that's not true. All of us as the church are married to Jesus, and Jesus is God, so you are married to God. And the relationship that God has with us is a covenantal love. And that is from the very beginning in the Bible. If you read 
all the way, you will see how intimately God is connected to us. So, for example, the prophet Hosea speaks about Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God in the Old Testament for the Israelites. And Hosea says, Yahweh will betroth you to himself forever with tenderness. And Ezekiel spins a marvelous tale of courtship and of betrayal and of redemptive pardon to explain how God is married to his people. So what I'm getting at here is that the metaphor of marriage imaging God's relationship with his people is deep in the Bible. Yahweh is to Israel as a husband is to his wife. That's in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, you are going to see that Jesus is married to the church. Israel is the people of God. And God, Israel dwells in Jerusalem. So God dwells in Jerusalem. And we are on our way to Jerusalem, the Bible says. And now Israel in the Old Testament is the people of God. And we are the people of God today. So we are the new Israel as the church. And the church is the people of God. So Jesus himself applies this tradition of God being married to the church to himself. When the Pharisees ask Jesus' disciples, why are they not fasting like those of John the Baptist? We are hearing from Mark's gospel right now in the church, uh, in the readings that we have been having, such as today's reading, for example, is from Mark's gospel, because this is the year that we listen to Mark. And in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, when um, all the party poopers, or uh, the Pharisees, you know, uh, and all the, the holy people, you know, of, uh, of that age, right? All the, the, the people who don't like to party, who don't like to enjoy life, and religious people can be like that, you know. Uh, you know what that you, you know about those religious people. <laughs> uh, like the, in the, when I was in, in in California and I lived in a very small town, I always wanted to go to shopping really late at night. Because I didn't want to bump into some of the religious people in the grocery store. Oh, yes, I know. Because of gossip. Yes. And I, so I would go usually past 10 o'clock. Because the only big store was a Walmart and a Safeway. And the Safeway was very expensive. So I would always go to the Walmart. It was cheaper. Mm -hmm. and I'm in the, in the Walmart past 10 o'clock, and one of the regular religious people is there. And I said, oh, God, you have a sense of humor. The one person I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> and she's coming right at me. <laughs> and I had already gone through the store. This is past 10 o'clock. And she looks in the cart that I have. And I had a six pack there. Oh no. <laughs> so wild. Of Diet Coke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course it was Diet Coke, right? <laughs> Actually it was a uh, Negra Mondello, which is very tasty. Tasty beer. Okay, so I beer is a, has good properties. It, it cleans your kidneys. <laughs> yeah, one or two beers isn't bad. It cleans your kidneys. Prevents kidney stones. Really. The problem isn't that 
some of you clean your kidneys is that you have them all wa washed out. <laughs> <laughs> and so she looks, she looks in the cart and she says, I could just picture her right now. And she goes like this and she says, does the bishop know you drink beer? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. I was very young back then. I was 26 when I went there. Uh -huh. Very young. Okay. So they thought, you know, here's this kid, right? That they have. 16. And she says, does the bishop know you drink beer? And I said, no. But I'm sure he will now. <laughs> <laughs> When you write to him, when you write to him, give him my love. Right. <laughs> oh my. What she didn't know is that the bishop didn't just drink beer, but wine. Right, and everything. I won't tell you which bishop though. <laughs> but you, you get the idea, okay? And so the same party poopers, and there's there's really no room for sourpuss Christians. <laughs> Who's going to want to be one? Not me. Who's going to want to be Catholic? Or Christian? Or a follower of Jesus? If we're all, you know, have, as the Pope says, funeral faces. <laughs> if you look like you're always at a funeral, <laughs> or if you have a vinegar face. <laughs> This is not my words, this is the words of Pope Francis. He said to priests, he had a meeting with priests, he says, you all look like you just had vinegar. Are you at a funeral? You know what that's like. Who's gonna wanna who's gonna wanna be in church? Who's gonna wanna be a Christian if you're if you if, if you look like that? And it's not just priests, okay? So this is the same thing that happened during Jesus' days. And we haven't gotten too far away from that time as well. The religious people were also vinegar people. And they left the wine out and so it turned into vinegar. vinegar. You shouldn't leave the wine too long. Drink it. Okay. <laughs> 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 so this is precisely what happened. And they went to Jesus and they questioned him because Jesus liked parties. Look at that. Look at okay. He first of all, let's let's just start with this one. How did he start his life of ministry? He started at a party. Where where was it? the party was a wedding? Yes. <gasps> the wedding yes. feast of Cana. Is there a light bulb going on right now? Yes. He started with a party. And what did they serve at the party? Wine. Wine. And they, would, they served a lot because they actually ran out. And you know, in those days, you didn't throw a party if you didn't have enough wine. Uh-huh. It was disgraceful to run out, which is why Mary gets involved. She got involved because she feels sorry for this couple that's run out of wine because it's shameful for the family. And if you know anything about Middle Eastern people, we're talking here Palestine, okay? Middle Eastern people. Shame is really bad, which is why what do they do if, right now if a young woman, okay, uh, sleeps? with a young man, or maybe not so young, okay, whatever, she, what does the father do, or the family do, to the young woman? They kill her. They stole her because she shamed the family. You see how shame, shame is the worst thing for that culture, to this very day. This is Jesus' culture we're talking about. So, Jesus gets involved, he doesn't want to, that's why he tells Mary, and Mary comes up to him and says, hey, you know, they've run out of wine. And what does Jesus say? What do I have to do with this woman? Why? Because he's enjoying the party. He's having a good time at the party. But he gets involved because he doesn't want the shame to come upon his family. And 
he turns the water into wine so that they don't run out of wine. So he starts his life of ministry on earth, his three years of ministry with a party. And how does he end? Uh, I was with another party. Yeah, right. And what was served at that party? You know, Why? the Romans served water. And there, now when they have the Eucharist, they have water. We don't have water. We serve what Jesus served. Wine. And some people say, well, you should have grape juice. No, he served wine. He served wine. <clears throat> now, when you come to church, you should only have a sip, okay? Not like some of you, you know, you, you <laughs> take a big gulp and there's not, 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 left, not left for somebody else. Because people think, you know, the more, the more wine I drink, the more Jesus I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, okay, the Eucharist. But the point is, Jesus ended his life here on earth with another party. Mm -hmm. Because of what he says to the party poopers here in Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 18, okay. On one occasion, the followers of John the Baptist and the Pharisees were fasting. And so some people came to Jesus and asked him, Why is it that the disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but yours do not? Uh -huh. Why is it, Father God, that at your masses people laugh uh -huh. when at, at all the other ones they don't? Why is it that you tell jokes and all the other ones don't? Uh, why is it that it's a more relaxed environment? Uh, and Jesus answered and says, Do you expect the guests at a wedding party to go without food or drink? Of course not. As long as the bridegroom is with them, they will party. This is Jesus. So is the bridegroom not with us? Mm -hmm. Is the bridegroom not with us? The bridegroom is with us. And so if the bridegroom is with you, you, you are married to Jesus, you should party, enjoy life. For your husband takes delight in you. The one you're married to takes delight in you. This is what Jesus says. Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The church is the bride of Christ and you are the church. And thus you are married to Christ for he is the bridegroom. That is why Okay, priests, for example, myself, okay, we are not single, but we are married to the church. So I'm married to all of you, whether I like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> rather than for better. <laughs> so today I told you that we have the Feast of the Conversion of Paul. And those of you who read the readings would have read the first reading today. And the first reading talks about Paul's conversion. And Paul was on the road to Damascus and he gets blinded by this light. I had Mass this morning, so I've heard the reading, but I also read it before. 
that's, that's all of you before you go to mass. You should be reading the readings, you know, because sometimes you go and the person who's reading them you can't understand them and they read too fast, whatever, okay? Or you're still thinking about breakfast or coffee or something, so you miss it. That way you know it, okay? So don't be like, I don't get much out of mass. Because you don't put much into it. That's what, if you don't put much into it, you won't get much out of it. What you put into it, you get out of it. You go to a church where the homilies may not be the best, or the sermons, or whatever you want to call them. Well, find something online and read up, you know, if the homily's good, good. If it's not, uh, icing on the cake, okay? If the homily's great, it's helpful. But if it's not, I'm still at the feast, okay? Uh, but today's reading, the first reading, talks about the conversion of Paul. And Paul's on the road to Damascus. He gets blinded, he falls off of his horse, and Jesus speaks to him. And Paul was a big persecutor of Christians. In fact, the Bible says he was present at the first martyrdom of the first martyr, Stephen. He was there. The Bible recounts that in the Acts of the Apostles, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the one that comes immediately after the Gospels. And when Jesus speaks to him, when he blinds him, he says, Paul, except he doesn't say Paul, because his name was Saul, before Jesus changes his name, becomes Paul after his conversion as a sign that he is now a new creation. That he's born again. Remember when Jesus says, are you going to be born again when you get converted, become a new person? And so Jesus speaks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And Paul asks him, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. Now, who was he persecuting? He was persecuting the church. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is equating himself with you and I, because he's married to you and I. And when a person is married, when you're married to your husband, the Bible teaches us that the two become one. So you and Jesus are the same thing. You get it? Like you and your husband are one and the same. When you're married to somebody, it's you and them, not two different people, but you're the same person. The two become one flesh, one body. One, one flesh. So you and Jesus are the very same thing. Now that's a big responsibility if you, if you ask me all you religious people who are here today. Mm -hmm. That's a big responsibility. You may be the only gospel somebody may ever read. You may be the only Bible they will ever lay, a, lay their eyes upon. You may be the only Jesus they ever come into contact with. That's a big responsibility to all of us. So, the reason why I started with Isaiah today is because when I take this in, that the God of the universe has found me good enough, worthy, to marry me, to be with me, that should be a great boost to my self-esteem. I don't need Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz to tell me, you know, how good I am when the God of the universe has told me that. I don't need some self-help self -help book or a worldly figure to tell me or someone in my life to tell me 
when the God of the universe has told me that he delights in me. And Isaiah, the reason why, see, I could have chosen Hosea, as I told you before, because Hosea speaks of this, or Ezekiel, or someone else, one of the other prophets. But I chose Isaiah because Isaiah goes beyond the other prophets. He presents to us an outright celebration of a wedding. God's relation to Israel, to us, is an undying covenant of love and fidelity. You shall be called my delight, he says, for the Lord delights in you. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder marries you. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. In other words, God is pleased with you. He made you. He doesn't make junk. So you're fine, just the way you are. And if somebody else tells you that you're not, you know, they're wrong. You're wonderfully made. As the Bible declares in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know this very well. So just the way you are with all your works, you're, you're funny. There's nothing wrong with you. You have to accept yourself as you are, for God accepts you as you are. God's desire and delight is to be one with us, to share in our life and our destiny, through thick or thin. Thick or thin. So Paul compares uh, the church to a body. You know, the, the church is the body of Christ. So you are the body of Christ. Compares the church to a human body. In order to pick up a glass of orange juice, it is not enough to have an arm and four fingers. Without an opposable thumb, you are lost. There are all kinds of things inside of us that we need without thinking about them at all. Few people get up in the morning and think about their colons. <laughs> Maybe some of you do, I <laughs> But think about Think about it. what would happen to you if you didn't have your colon? Or oh. better yet, what would happen to you as a human person if you if you didn't have the Audi, you know? I mean if you yeah. just had your, your mouth but you didn't have a, an exit. It would bad I mean, think of it, you've all experienced being plugged up. <coughs> <laughs> now you're awake. <laughs> you know, the prune juice and whatever else. I mean, uh, <laughs> think about it. You don't, you, most of you don't get up in the morning and think about how, how painful you are for your colon. Or your collarbone. That's true. Or your mitochondria. We are very happy to have two of everything we're supposed to have two of. And we are very happy to have everything we're supposed to have one of. Mm -hmm. We have a built sense of wholeness that will not go away inside of us. And so Paul is trying to persuade all of us that what was true inside of our own skin is also true outside of it. That wholeness is a matter of many different parts all being themselves and doing their jobs. Unity and diversity are not contradictory terms. 
Our survival depends not on our sameness, but on the infinite variety inside of us. Okay, so now, all is fine and great when we talk about our liver and our kneecap or our colon. That's all great. We rejoice at their differences and we wouldn't want either to be like the other. But it's a different story when we talk about us living in a community with a bunch of other people who look, smell, smell, uh, I experience that all the time, okay, especially in, sometimes in the confessional, you know, somebody comes in and, oh my goodness, <laughs> like, please, you know, brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not going to say anything to them or make them feel bad because that, see, I, you have to put up with people in your life. People who may talk differently than you, look differently than you, or even smell differently than you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's called community. We got people who are perfectly cheerful and who can talk for 30 minutes straight without stopping, Rosemary. Oh, thank you, <laughs> But I'm happy. <laughs> and then we have people who don't say much at all. Elaine. <laughs> See, we need everybody, and I know most of you, so I can find out. One, pe one person speaks so intimately of God, people around her feel like a spiritual slouch. Another prays big hot air balloons on Sunday, and then goes home and beats his family. That's... No wonder we like it better when we talk about livers and kneecaps. And yet, we all have to live with one another. So, we join a community. We are all a community here. And uh, those of you who uh, went with me to Poland, and there are many of you who went with me to Poland, you know that for two weeks, there was 34 of us stuck with each other. <laughs> <laughs> and we all had to put up with each other, you know, one way or another. <laughs> but you survived. So, we join a community because we're not looking for sameness, but we're looking for closeness and support, and that is the church. And the reason why you need to accept and delight in other people, in other people, all the people who are around you, you know, the reason why you should accept and delight in other people is because God accepts and delights in you. So, you have to learn to put up with the liver in your life. When they call it. You have to accept all the people in your life just like they are. In other words, let me put it this way. We all have a hangnail in our life. All of us. From time to time. We have a hangnail. When you cut it off, take care of it, another one will appear. God delights in you just the way you are. He accepts you. You are married to Him. And He's asking you to accept all those around you and to delight in them as well. In that, we form a community in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you are calling us in this particular reading that we have heard today to be happily married. Happily married. And so we pray for that grace to be happily married to each other 
in the church and to you. And so we hear those words, like a young man taking a virgin as his bride. He who formed you has married you, and as a groom is delighted with his bride, so your God is delighted in you. And we thank you that you are delighted with us, that you have married us. And as we glorify you for that grace, we say glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, for God and Amen. And may the Lord bless all of you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, if you're recording, you can stop.